Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Jeroen Wording speaking from the uh, Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Office in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, a warm welcome to everybody who is interested in joining our webinar on uh, preparing for natural disasters, extreme weather events, and climate change. I highly appreciate that there is so many interest uh, from, from your side on uh, participating in uh, this webinar. We believe at Swiss Re uh, it uh, to be of the highest importance to accelerate uh, our awareness and risk mitigation efforts for a changing climate. Uh, as you will hear, this is not a problem of the future, uh, but it is uh, happening as we speak. I'm very proud uh, that we can host this webinar uh, and present to you uh, experts uh, of the highest degree on this topic. Rolf, can you please introduce the program and the speakers? Thank you very much, Jeroen. Let me quickly run through the agenda for you today. A warm welcome from Swiss Re Institute side as well. So, Lucia Bevere, author of the above-mentioned Sigma report and sitting with me here in Zurich, will present the key findings of this year's Sigma natural catastrophes. Then, Jeanette Bessenbinder, Senior Advisor Climate Services at the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, will take a specific look at extreme weather events and climate change and draw conclusions on what we can expect in the Benelux countries in the coming years. And then, finally, Delta Commissioner Peter Glass will showcase how the world's largest land reclamations, the Dutch polders, are protected and made future ready in times of climate change. Our experts will speak for about 10 minutes each and Peter for about 25 minutes. I will then bring the panel into a conversation followed by a Q&A to answer your questions. Please note that whatever you are seeing out there, we cannot hear you, but on the left of your screen, you will see a text box. Just send you your questions and comments on the go via this uh, text box at any time. Instead of traditional Q&A sessions after each presentation, we will save all your questions for the panel discussion. Now, let's hear from Lucia about the Sigma 2020 on natural catastrophes. Lucia is author of the annual Sigma on natural catastrophes and man-made disasters. She has published nine Sigma studies since 2005. In addition, she is responsible for the Sigma Catastrophe Database, the only internationally available commercial catastrophe database to record natural catastrophes and man-made disasters. So, Lucia, great to have you with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rolf, and welcome everybody from my side, too. So, uh, Swiss Re Institute Sigma uh, monitors the industry catastrophe losses already since 1970, and the data thus collected forms the basis of the annual Sigma publication on natural catastrophes and man-made disasters. In this publication, we, uh, each year, we reflect on the lessons learned from the global catastrophic activity. This presentation will summarize the main findings of the 2020 edition. So what happened in 2019? Following two costly back-to-back -back years for natural disasters in 2017 and 2018, losses were certainly lower in 2019 below the 10-year average. The main reason is the lack of severe hurricanes in the U.S., which is the area of the world with the highest hurricane hazard exposure and also high insurance penetration. Another feature of the year is that the Earth's warming trend continue, continued. 2019 was the second warmest year on record, and the last decade was the warmest decade on record. New heat records were set in many regions, including Europe and Northern Europe, too. While the previous two years triggered a widespread reckoning with the climate change risk, 2019 added an acute sense of urgency for climate action. <laughs> the focus this year of, uh, of the SIGBA publication was precisely climate change. This slide shows that in what insurers have paid in the catastrophe claims over time. Of course, it shows here a rising trend, and it also shows that at least 70% of the losses are originated from weather, by, from weather events. Hence, climate change is bound to affect the great majority of our cut losses in a way or in another. 
Is climate change responsible for this rise in weather-related losses? Let us say that it is difficult to say for sure if a specific weather event was made more likely or more severe as a result of climate change. The processes of how a changing climate impacts the frequency and severity of natural catastrophes are still not fully understood. And that is because it remains challenging to distinguish between natural climate change, natural variability, and anthropogenic climate change. Sometimes these two counteract each other, sometimes they play together, leading to an even stronger uh, climate signal. I will try to use the events of 2019 to answer this question. For example, Hurricane Dorian, let's start with the tropical cyclone of Atlantic risk. Hurricane Dorian, the strongest of the 2019 North Atlantic season, maintained Category 5 winds for the longest duration on record. For the Bahamas, it was the costliest NAPCAT event ever. It is also representative of the decreasing trend in the forward speed of tropical cyclones. Is this a signal of climate change? We can say that this is consistent with some of the expected manifestations of climate change on this particular peril. The decreasing trend in the forward speed of hurricanes allows the storm, the storm surge, to occur over multiple high tides and rainfall to accumulate over a number of days. But the interplay between weather and climate at the basis of the formation of the hurricanes is quite complex for us to fully attribute this event to climate change. For now, natural variability still dominates, but some lost components, what we call secondary effects, like storm surge, see Hurricane Sandy, or hurricane-induced precipitation, see Hurricane Harvey, are showing some increase and are likely to play an even bigger role going forward. Equally, Typhoon Hagibis in Japan, following back-to-back -back years of costly typhoons in Japan. You may remember Typhoon Jabe in 2018 and the flooding associated with Prapiron in, again in 2018. In 2019, Typhoon Hagibis and Faxai further underscored the high vulnerability of urban regions to both typhoon wind and flood risks, despite the structural mitigations that had been built in the 50s and in the 60s. Together with JB, they challenged the current industry's tropical cyclone wind and flood risk view in Japan. Are these heavy losses um, result, the result of climate change? Again, we see no particular sign of increased activity, no significant long-term climate change trend for uh, typhoons frequency in Japan, Northwest Pacific. But we do see strong natural multi-decadal vari variability. So again, natural variability still dominates. Hence, the heavy losses of the past two years were rather due to the underestimated exposure. Then we, in Africa, Cyclone Ida devastated the coastal town of Beira in Mozambique, affecting also the neighboring countries. Nearly two million people were left homeless triggering a multi-year rebuilding process whose cost will be shouldered by international aid and, of course, the local communities, given the high protection gap. There are some signs of increased cyclone activity in the area, but rather the devastation from Idai was made worse by vulnerability. Many low-lying cities and towns are more vulnerable than others to sea level rise, some poor countries are located where they might experience more of the negative effects of climate change. And the poor, in general, lack the means to prepare themselves for disasters already today. Let us compare Mozambique with Netherlands, for example, a country faced with the threat of sea level rise and subsidence, but which is at the forefront of climate adaptation. Going forward, local mitigation and adaptation measures will make a big difference. And if we move to um, Australia and to the wildfire hazard, after two record loss years in California, wildfires devastated areas of eastern Australia as never before. 
in what was the longest and most distractive fight season ever. The chart on the right shows the dramatic increase in insured losses from wildfires. Now, wildfires are an ever-present hazard. They are an essential part of the renewal process of the forest ecosystem in the world. Every single day in the world there are forests burning. The increased activity of the last few years is a sign of climate change. Here we can say with a higher level of confidence that climate change is fueling already wildfire risk in Australia, in California, and the world over, a result of many attribution studies that have been done. But even in this case, the heavy losses of the last few years were made worse uh, by the, inc the rising exposure in the wildland urban interface where houses and forests meet. Because of this, there is a greater risk of uh, uh, fire outbreaks of this magnitude to become more frequent even without warmer and drier weather. In fact, to date, the majority of the trend of increasing uh, losses from weather risk has derived from exposure accumulation, a result of economic development and urbanization, as these images dramatically depict. This is to say that um, climate change is only one of the many variables in a dynamic risk landscape in a complex interplay of many factors. For sure, climate change is the most complex variable and one that comes with a lot of uncertainties as to its timing and impact but also one which we do know will amplify the losses. So overall, no quantifiable signal of climate change on our data sets, but that does not mean that there isn't any. We know that in a warming world, the patterns of severe weather are changing, even though we cannot prove how much of them is caused by climate change. In fact, some of the effects of climate change are certainly already evident today. Both the frequency and intensity, for example, of torrential rainfall events are increasing. Sea level rise, driven by a combination of higher ocean temperature, temperatures and melting glaciers, may exacerbate storm surge and coastal flood uh, events. We also see longer and more frequent heat waves, which in turn may trigger uh, bigger fire outbreaks. So there are already some evidence uh, effects of climate change. Again, but it's still not possible to fully quantify this impact. Thank you very much for this. Over to, to Rolf. Thank you, Lucia. And I think what's interesting here from the first presentation to see that besides this climate change, uh, the risk coming along, there's also many other risks to consider given how we as societies and countries develop and uh, particularly for the decision makers and the risk managers uh, watching this webinar. Uh, interesting to see that the Sigma report reflects on a more holistic picture here. Now, let's move on to uh, the research side on extreme weather and climate change. So our next speaker, Janet Bessenbinder, is Senior Advisor Climate Services at the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute. Janet is working with the KNMI since 2005 and involved in climate services development, inventories of users' requirements related to climate change data and information, and tailoring of climate data for users ranging from impact and adaptation researchers, companies, over to policy makers. She has been involved in various cross-sectoral climate initiatives, for example, in the development of the KNMI 06, the 14, and now the newest 23 climate scenarios. So, Jeanette, a pleasure to have you with us. Over to the Netherlands. The word is yours. Thank you, Rolf. Um, I will tell something more about extreme weather and climate change. As Lucia already showed, many natural catastrophes are directly related to extreme weather. In this presentation, I will show something on observed trends in weather extremes, on attribution of these extreme events, and on climate projections. Um, this is a slide of uh, a presentation of the World Meteorological Organization. They make an overview of uh, global climate every year. I will not show the, the video, but you can look at it later. Uh, I only showed here a few of the statements that they make. 
Uh, the first one, as Lucia also mentioned, uh, 2019 was the second warmest year on record. And 2019 also concluded a decade of exceptional global heat, not uh, a decade with a warmer average temperature that was observed before. And the trend is also expected to continue. Year 2020 also started with a record warm. This is a picture of the global temperature um, uh, from IPCC. Um, it is clear that it shows um, the temperature reconstruction, global temperature, with different methods, slightly different and different data sets. Uh, but what you can see is that there's a clear upward trend in temperature in all data sets. And currently, the global mean temperature is about 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial temperature. Pre-industrial is for the period 1815 up to 1900. That's also the reference for the Paris Agreement. Um, many people, oh, I, I skipped this one, sorry. Yeah, many people will remember the exceptionally high uh, temperatures in the summer of 2019. Uh, the average temperature, maximum temperature in the Netherlands, for example, is 22, 23 degrees. Um, but during that summer, there were several days where the temperature was <coughs> above 40 degrees Celsius. The last figure shows the average maximum temperature in Europe in the period of 25 to 29 of June. And the right figure gives the deviation from normal. And often you can see that was more than 10, 10 degrees Celsius. In a large part of Western Europe, never higher temperatures were measured. High temperatures, although, do not cause a lot of direct damage, mainly problems for human health, but also plants and animals are affected, the demand and availability of water is affected, and often it coincides also with dry conditions. Uh, with such extreme events, many people ask whether this is due to climate change. That was also something that Lucia already pointed to. Although we cannot indicate whether such a single event is due to climate change, we can indicate whether the change of certain climate extremes has increased due to anthropogenic climate change. This is called extreme event attribution. Uh, such a study for the summer of 2019 was done by the World Weather Attribution Group. NMI, my institute, is also part of it. As the climate variable that they studied, they took the three-day maximum temperature. And the reason for that is that people often do not have many problems with just one very hot day, but health problems clearly increase when there are more and very hot days in a row. The conclusion of this study was that such, a, such heat waves in France and the Netherlands would have had return periods that are about 100 times higher, at least 10 times, without climate change. So there was a clear significant increase of the occurrence of these kind of heat waves due to climate change. Um, for rainfall, uh, these attributions attribution studies are more difficult since there is a large year-to-year -year variability which makes it more difficult to determine what the significant changes have occurred. Besides climate change, there's also a change in our living environment. Also Lucia pointed already to that. Uh, and this may result in larger or sometimes less damage uh, when there's adaptation. When more is insured, the claimed damage uh, will be higher after an extreme event. So now let's look at uh, the flooding after Hurricane Harvey in August 2017. Um, during that event, in three days, 750 to 1,000 millimeters rain, rain fell. Um, first, an attribution study was done into the extreme rainfall. But later on, people also looked into the impact of the resulting flooding, in this case, the discharge. The researchers found that the change in urbanization had a much larger impact on the final flooding or the discharge that led to the flooding than the change in climate. Um, also, attribution studies related to drought have been executed. For example, on the bushfires related to the drought in Australia in 2019-2020. Um, researchers found that 
there was a significant increase in heat intensity, as we expected already with the increase in global temperature, but there wasn't a clear increase in drought. Um, but when they looked at the impact, they found that, uh, in this case, the fire weather index had increased by at least 30% as a result of anthropogenic climate change. So also here, there is an uh, impact of uh, human action, uh, the environment, on the risk. This was all about the past and current climate, but now let's look uh, at the projections for the future. Uh, these pictures are from IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, many countries make more detailed projections for their own countries or regions for calculating potential impacts and adaptation measures. Also, we do this in the Netherlands with the uh, KNMI climate scenarios. Temperature increases everywhere, as you can see uh, in the various pictures, um, and at least also on the, the left one. Um, the more greenhouse gases, the stronger the temperature increase is. Uh, future changes in precipitation vary more. In general, Northern Europe expects an increase in winter and also in summer rainfall, although the increase in summer rainfall is smaller. In Central Europe, some increase in projected winter rainfall, uh, so some increase in, projected in winter rainfall is projected, uh, but for summer, a decrease in summer rainfall is projected. For the summer in the Netherlands, it's not clear yet what will happen in summer. It could become drier, but also uh, hardly drier, or even a small increase in summer rainfall. At KNMI, we do research uh, to see what kind of mechanisms could cause these drier conditions and whether these become more probable in the future. Before going to the conclusions, I want to take a short look too at sea level rise. The last years or decades, we obtained new insights in how the Antarctic ice shelves decay. There are three new important insights, and they are shown with the, the numbers on this picture. First of all, we see that there's also melting from beneath the, of, the, of the shelves, the ice shelves. Although the temperatures are very low, you wouldn't like to swim in it, uh, there is melting of the shelves. And secondly, uh, there's also a, a melting on top of the shelves. On the, and since there is also melting on the bottom of it, you see that the shelves break much earlier than we thought before. Then thirdly, what we also see is that the ice cliffs that uh, remain there, if um, the shelves break off, become more unstable. Before they were supported by the shelves, but now they aren't there anymore and they also uh, break down. Um, all this accelerates the melting of Antarctica. If you wonder what this looks like, you can look at the pictures at uh, the right. The top one is an example of the shelf that can break down and the bottom one is an example of the uh, ice cliffs. Okay, um, but why do we look at the Antarctic as Europe? It's so far away. Uh, but what we don't realize is, um, until several years ago, is that changes in the Antarctic are more important for Europe than changes in ice sheets in Greenland due to the gravitation effects. Uh, very large ice masses attract water, and therefore the sea level is relatively higher near these ice masses. When these ice masses melt partly, the attraction diminishes, and although global sea level increases due to the melting, the sea level near these ice masses may decrease. And the opposite is true for regions very far away from these ice masses, such as Europe. So the relative increase in global sea level is higher near Europe. These new insights also resulted in new projections from IPCC for global sea level rise especially the upper range has become higher, as you can see in the, uh, the picture more on the bottom. Um, this was from a publication in 2019 from the, the special report on oceans and uh, the cryosphere. Then I go to the conclusions, and um, I want to conclude with four things. 
As I've indicated, for several climate variables, we observed already significant changes, not just for temperature, also for other climate variables. And these may result in increased or sometimes decreased risk. The second point is that with attribution, we can indicate how the frequency of extremes has changed due to anthropogenic climate change. This may be useful, hopefully, for awareness raising. The third point is that climate change is not the only factor that results in changes in risks. Also, Lucia showed this. Uh, other socioeconomic developments may be even more important for the increased risks. And thirdly, um, with the help of climate scenarios, we can est make estimates for changes in risks for the future. And this may help to reduce the risk in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, so much Janet. Uh, I think this was very insightful and the reason that the level of expertise that you showed um, is also the main reason also of our valued partnership uh, that we have with your institute. And I'm uh, also thinking about the first point in, on this conclusion slide to be aware of the, the, the downside and upside elements of the climate change towards risk, particularly when it comes to decision makers and, and risk managers in, in the Benelux, uh, Benelux countries that are here in the webinar. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, please uh, keep on sending your questions uh, on, via the question box on the left-hand side of your screen so that we can take them up as soon as we get to the panel and the Q&A part. Now, uh, to the final presentation, when, uh, when I think about this one, this, this final presentation, there is this famous Dutch saying, uh, God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. So Delta Commissioner Peter Glass will now shed light on this saying by referring to the world's largest and land reclamation from the sea, how the country protects itself from related water risks, and how it adopts to climate, climate change. I could probably spend the rest of the webinar introducing uh, Peter's track record uh, in the field of NGO and in the academia and governmental, um, but maybe there's uh, two positions that I would like to highlight for this webinar. He's the commissioner to the Dutch Delta program since 2019, a multi-billion project nationwide, and he's also the international chair of the OECD Water Governance Initiative since 2013. Peter, it's a true honor to have you with us from the Home Office, as I heard, not from the Hague. <laughs> and uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf. Um, I need to use the, the ah there we are thank you very much i will take it from here uh, it's my pleasure to be with you all of you in the benelux and maybe uh, beyond uh, to uh, share some insights uh, on the uh, dutch delta program and uh, i realize we uh, are running short of in time already so i will without further ado i will uh, i will uh, start this and these are some of the data that I picked up from the uh, uh, SIGMA report, and uh, uh, you are familiar with those indicating the, well, the, uh, the economic losses, uh, the incidents uh, increasing, and uh, also the economic uh, loss and the uh, insured losses. And uh, it seems uh, to my uh, layman's eye that the gap is increasing. So this just underlines that climate adaptation is uh, is of the utmost importance uh, worldwide uh, we have uh, both the mitigation debate uh, political debate to a large extent and the adaptation two sides of the same coin i would i would uh, argue um, anyhow uh, this is not just uh, insurance companies but it is a world economic forum insight that uh, every year uh, uh, a thousand uh, leaders of industries and, and governments uh, uh, are questioned about what the likelihood is of extreme events and what then the impact would be. And these are just uh, over the past uh, four years, the uh, top five uh, likelihood events. And most of those are connected to, uh, to uh, weather and climate and biodiversity loss and natural disasters. And the impact of those, uh, then you see uh, also the weapons of mass destruction. That's a different topic altogether, but uh, actually also water crises. So we are in a water crisis situation globally, uh, I would argue. And this is also why I'm engaged very much uh, with the OECD Water Governance Initiative. And you're welcome to uh, 
to go uh, to Google that uh, water governance initiative, OECD, and uh, it should be very interesting to uh, to all of you. Uh, anyhow, um, uh, on the global agenda, the SDGs you are all familiar with, and at some point I added these little droplets just to illustrate uh, that to my mind, a lot of those are clearly linked to water management, river basin management, the sanitation and water and drinking water availability, and billions of people still lack lack these basic uh, uh, supplies and, and 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 good good governance and good water management. And and by the way, uh, the world community has decided 2030 we will attain these goals. So uh, it's just 10 years ahead of us and we'll see how far we can we we, we can go well uh, since uh, all of the benelux uh, is in this little map i need not uh, introduce where we are in amsterdam the hague and rotterdam in the coastal areas i'm down south where i'm now my home office is actually my home and has been for 13 weeks consecutive now with COVID 19 as many of you i'm sure have the same experience. This is a map that not everybody uh, is acquainted with. Uh, anything dark blue here is below sea level. And anything uh, lighter blue and purple, if you look closely, this is the Meuse or Dutch Maas River, um, uh, is also flood prone. Um, and well, to maintain uh, our feet dry, to keep our feet dry, we have a very large infrastructure and only part of that is included in this slide we have hundreds of kilometers of um, of, of, of rivers the major rivers and smaller rivers and and, and smaller streams obviously uh, if you all the blue and purple shades together 60 percent of the country it is a delta by definition but 60 percent is flood prone either permanently below sea level or uh, uh, irregularly uh, with high uh, uh, discharges from, from the rivers. Uh, and behind the dikes that protect us uh, are 10 million people either living or working or both. And the protection um, uh, is uh, provided by more than 17,000 kilometers of flood defenses, dikes. Uh, and the accompanying uh, locks and sluices and pumping stations is 24-7 uh, business. Or on top of that, you have many other issues that are outside the scope of my current position with water quality, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the public spending to maintain all of this and keep on investing, also looking to the future, and we'll get to that in the uh, upcoming slides, all in all, uh, 7.8 billion euros annually divided over different branches of government. Um, and uh, well, that's a lot of money. Um, and if you compare it to the gross national product of the Netherlands, um, you could also say, well, it's 1%. 1% of GDP is protected, uh, protects uh, at least uh, two thirds of the country, which would otherwise uh, submerge. So this is, I, you know, I would argue, a good investment, or perhaps I should say a policy insurance premium. Having said that, if we go back in time, uh, yes, the Netherlands have a reputation. If you look at old maps, there's sometimes more water than land, and sometimes you can't see the difference. Uh, but in the, uh, over the course of centuries, we've reclaimed much of, of that land. So indeed, the Netherlands, to a high uh, degree, is man-made. Uh, although originally it was God given, I suppose. But anyhow, uh, that's a different discussion. Um, so with with that uh, history, uh, looking at the last century, still every century we've had major storm surges from the sea. And the last century we had 1916 uh, and 53 major storm surges. Um, for, uh, and after each of those, uh, a, a big investment program was launched uh, to rebuild and, and protect uh, the land, uh, because without that, there would be no Netherlands, or larger parts of the Netherlands would be permanently lost. Um, so uh, dams and barriers and the, uh, uh, the Afsluitdijk, the closure dam of the former branch of the North Sea, which was called the Southern Sea, the Zuiderzee, now Lake Eisel, our largest freshwater uh, uh, volume that we uh, that we have which is very important also for for drinking water supply and uh, and agriculture 
Now, um, after each of those incidences, uh, all of these civil engineering works, which are world renowned, uh, we perhaps thought ourselves to be safe against the uh, threats from the sea. But then in the 90s, we had uh, some uh, incidences at the, uh, from the rivers in the, the Maas or Mosa River flooded uh, twice and uh, near flooding uh, from the branches of the Rhine River. Uh, 250,000 people had to be uh, evacuated. Uh, and that, this led to a sort of an awareness and a question, uh, are we ready for the next century? Uh, some tipping points in the physical conditions, uh, well, came, uh, were looming. Um, but also translated into tipping points in the policy approach. So the integrated safety policy, not only sit or, or assume to be sitting safe behind the dikes, but also look at the physical uh, layout of, of, of that, what is behind the dikes, what is protected, but also uh, risk reduction uh, schemes, evacuation even, uh, in the unlikely event of, of, an, uh, of, of, of a flooding. So we now have a three-tier or three-layer approach in, in safety. But new concepts, the, the rivers in the Netherlands, so 600 kilometers of major rivers, they were confined in, uh, over the course of maybe 200 years and ever a narrower uh, uh, dikes. We took a lot of land from the river. It's, it's, it's uh, fertile land, obviously. Uh, so the dikes had to be built up higher and higher. And, and so we changed that. We, we, the room for the river became a new concept and more than 30 projects were were uh, were carried out uh, again an investment of uh, well over two billion euros in 25 years and the concept of building with nature where the classical civil engineering uh, well you can associate that with uh, well stone and steel and concrete uh, now the uh, the modern civil engineer also knows about hydrology about mor morphology even ecology so building with nature but still maintaining that uh, all important safety level, that is the new vocabulary, uh, if you will. So, uh, well, we learned some lessons. Uh, so these uh, pictures uh, for, late, for later reference, if you have a look at the uh, presentation, you see all these projects and billions of euros were, were invested uh, in the last century and, and this century already. So we've had the, the sea, the rivers, and now we at, by the end of last century, uh, the last decade, uh, and it was mentioned uh, also by uh, by Jeanette, uh, torrential rainfall. So it seems that these incidences are increasing uh, also during summer. And that was not uh, a common, uh, as far as I understand. I'm not a specialist on the on these uh, statistics uh, as the uh, Royal Institute is, but uh, this was a case uh, where all of the uh, uh, potato uh, harvest in the north was wasted in two days of rain. And um, uh, old even old structures where near where I was living near Rotterdam at the time uh, you still see the windmill and that was there for a purpose this was a retention area to uh, release the pressure from some of the dikes the, uh, the secondary dikes uh, um, uh, under pressure when the water levels were really high and all the pumps were working so this was flooded uh, uh, temporarily and then drained again not with the windmill with diesel engines and but in these the part of the country between The Hague and Rotterdam, we have we call it Westland, a lot of greenhouses and a lot of the cu cucumbers and paprikas and and uh, and uh, and tomato um, also uh, 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 harvest was lost. There was a, a a sort of a national insurance, if you will, a compensation fund, um, and this just this week of, uh, of, of torrential rain uh, costed uh, the, the coffers of central government 260 million euros, euros of today. It was Gilders back then, but uh, this is what it, and, and next year it happened again. So uh, again, um, we entered into the, new, the, the next century, the current, uh, this century, and then across the ocean, um, the Atlantic uh, uh, Katrina happened. And that was also a kind of a wake-up call, even for the Netherlands, uh, who had been aware, most more aware perhaps than average, and working on this, but still pictures like this, this could be Rotterdam, but it, this was, uh, this was uh, New Orleans. And, and, and people wading in polluted water towards higher ground or this, this uh, Superdome uh, sports facility, 
to get to safety. Uh, about the same number of people died as happened in the 53 disaster in the Netherlands. So again, there is a parallel. Millions of people were evacuated to the uh, uh, inlands of the United States, which obviously is much bigger. If you would project it on Europe, it was going from Rotterdam to Warsaw, perhaps, such distances. And many of the people have not returned. So this uh, then led to sort of a evaluation of what are we facing? And uh, yes, uh, I realize that not all of, it, all of it can be attributed to climate change, not of all of the uh, statistics are significant, perhaps, but still in this uh, well, cross section of the Netherlands with the dune, the natural dunes as protecting the land, uh, which is uh, below sea level. So this is a part of the western part of the country. Um, we have several trends, the sea level rise. Well, that's a fact, but will it increase? Will we have more in extreme storms? Question mark. And as a consequence, what does that to erosion of these of these dunes and other um, uh, protection uh, works that we have increased discharges of the river projected um, more and intense rainfall already observed and and projected uh, but also projected a decrease of the river discharge uh, during the summer period uh, the glaciers are melting so the Rhine River becomes a rain-fed river rather than uh, a dominantly by glacial uh, melting water uh, uh, fed river. Um, so also the, the summer drought, is that a trend uh, or is it not? Uh, well, uh, latest report by uh, the Royal Institute indicates that the inland uh, trend uh, certainly uh, is, is, uh, is significant. Um, but still, uh, and then uh, something different, salt intrusion, typically for the Netherlands, some other parts of the world as well, underneath uh, the dune, uh, dunes, but also through the mouths of the rivers, the estuaries, and behind that are the flower uh, tulip fields, and they are very sensitive to, to this uh, particular quality aspect. Subsidence has been going on for almost a thousand years, and, and thus, some of the polders are five, six meters below sea level uh, currently and still sinking. On top of that, uh, so these are all the physical conditions. On top of that, we have societal uh, developments, urban development, eco economic development. Uh, we have uh, socio uh, demographic developments. So all this is the, let's say, the playing field in which we want to look to the future. And a special committee was installed in uh, 2007 with a simple, rather simple question, which I summarize as, can we remain living in this Delta as a nation? Well, that's an ex existential question, um, obviously. Uh, after a year, uh, the chair, uh, former cabinet minister, Fearman, uh, um, uh, presented his findings and the, his committee's findings to the then uh, uh, Prime Minister and the responsible Minister for Water Management. And the answer was, our Delta, our Dutch Delta is sustainable. The threat of all these things I just mentioned is not acute, but measures to improve flood risk management and freshwater supply should be prepared urgently. And on top of that, the advice was prepare an annual Delta program, arranged both for regional coordination and elaboration and national supervision. It's a joint exercise appoint an independent Delta commissioner for oversight, and some things I will mention in a few slides from, from here, and secure adequate long-term funding, consolidate all of this in a legal basis, and that's been called the Delta Act. And uh, because the safety levels that were designed uh, uh, in the 60s, have, well, we have to uh, up those by a factor of 10. He didn't say how, but uh, this was the goal uh, that he put on the table and uh, that drew a lot of attention. And this is a rather complicated and uh, uh, dreary uh, uh, scheme. What I would like to mention is that the column in the center is the water column and then horizontally you have different branches of government, uh, the national, the provinces, the water authorities, uh, the waterschappen in Dutch, the municipalities and the disaster reduction organizations the Veiligheidsregio's in Dutch. But th there's connection between water and land use. There's also connection, obviously, to disaster management. 
So all of this has to uh, work together. And the Delta program is a facility, a program that overlies a lot of this, not all of it. For instance, water quality is not included in the Delta program. So there is focus um, in the program on the more quantitative aspects uh, rather than the qualitative uh, aspects. So every year since 2010, we've had a, a publication, and this is the uh, cover of the first uh, issue, and the aim is keep the Netherlands good, safe, and attractive to live and work. Um, three goals and three Delta plans are included in the program annually. First, safety against flooding. What are the measures to be taken? Second, the freshwater supply guaranteed. Well, with two consecutive years of drought and now a very dry uh, spring season up to now, uh, well, that was uh, uh, with foresight uh, that, that was already included then. And later on, we also included a, a Delta plan for climate-proof urban environments, spatial adaptation. Um, it is a multi-governance exercise, uh, very much based uh, on, on well, uh, the Royal Institute and other uh, uh, scientific institutions, joint fact-finding. Uh, no fact-free policies here. Uh, we, uh, we use the best available, internationally best available knowledge and models, etc. Uh, but it is, um, uh, if you look ahead, one, two, three generations, and this is what we do beyond 2050 and, and uh, the next uh, turn of the century, that is managing an uncertainty. And I'm sure there's a lot of uh, risk uh, managers uh, in the audience so you're familiar with developing scenarios, adaptive strategies, and, and be flexible. And then uh, the continuity, the institutional arrange, uh, arrangements, and the funding also have to be safeguarded. Um, top down and bottom up, I, I mentioned that already. So uh, we depend a lot on the regional uh, administrations as well as the national level. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sessions going on. Uh, actually by uh, regional steering committees to collect uh, creative and innovative ideas, combine water uh, challenges with other transitions, agriculture, energy, housing, um, uh, those kinds of transitions that have a connection with water and involve uh, local stakeholders. Not necessarily uh, through the Delta Commissioner, but uh, he makes he tries to make sure that at, at, le at local and regional level this is uh, is carried out. So the Delta Commissioner uh, is defined in the law. He has a legal responsibility to maintain progress, uniformity, in model scenarios, etc., and coherence. Um, in the end, the minister is politically responsible. So. Um, the Delta Fund every year uh, it is added uh, about 1 billion euros for all these uh, uh, programs and projects. Uh, it's not uh, it's not my money, if you know what I mean. It's uh, it's government's money, and the minister is is politically responsible for that. Dealing with uncertainty requires scenario approach, and so we have both the physical axis, uh, for instance, the moderate to rapid climate change and the socio-economic growth or squeeze. And so you end up with quadrants. And within these quadrants, and we gave them fancy names, uh, we develop pathways, adaptive pathways, um, and also uh, be flexible to, uh, if, if need be, change from one quadrant to another. And this is, uh, well, this is still uh, on the table uh, every year. I. Um, so I think this is, well, this summarizes it. But you have to sort of strike a balance between too little, too late, or too much, too early uh, to have uh, to link short-term investments with long-term challenges, and but avoid uh, regrets, uh, but also make uh, spatial reservations. So how to combine uh, robust and flexible. Building with nature is a concept that fits that uh, challenge very much, I would say. For flood risk management, uh, and each year the investment uh, budget is about 400 million from the central government budget, uh, and the, this is covered both by general taxation and the water board taxation on a 50-50 basis. Uh, then maintenance is carried out by the water board, so there's a, that's a, about the same. And also the National Water Agency for the Dutch audience, Rijkswaterstaat, they also draw from the uh, Delta Fund. For fresh water, we look at the different areas. Uh, there are different challenges in the lower parts of the more hilly terrain. 
And so this is also a regional exercise to look at how to become more robust and more resilient against the shortages, droughts. Um, and then climate adaptation, this was added later in the um, physical planning and the build-up uh, environment, uh, looking at uh, water hindrance from rain, heat stress, droughts, and regional flooding. All of the 330 municipalities, cities, and smaller towns have carried out a stress test in the course of uh, last year and the year before. And now we're entering into a, a next phase of dialogue, what to do about it, to, to work towards uh, uh, adaptation programs. And uh, well, maybe for discussion, uh, wouldn't it be nice or is it not required that also business, big business and small uh, businesses also do their own stress test? to see where, their, where the vulnerabilities lie and what to do about, about it. What, what can you do yourself? Uh, well, there's a lot, and I will provide, if that's uh, okay with you, uh, 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 an extended list of, uh, of uh, websites and, and, and tools on those websites. Uh, and for the Dutch uh, audience, they are uh, easily accessible, maybe for the international audience uh, with a little help from your Dutch colleagues. Uh, so link up, I would say. Uh, so there's a lot available um, uh, to have a, a jump start there. Uh, well, this is a picture of, a, of an inner city with heat stress. Um, then perhaps on the Delta Commissioner and his staff, all of its staff, all of my staff are in this, uh, this beach party. So it's very small, but around that, there's well, thousands of people. The Delta community in the Netherlands is very large, but the, this is a very small um, uh, staff actually, um, and I think uh, looking at the clock, I will I will skip those. Uh, well, maybe go back one item. Uh, where are where am I going too fast? Yeah, at the bottom there, the uh, the billions of euros. So the budget uh, for 14 years ahead is now uh, from from the the Delta Fund is about 18 billion euros. And we project until 2050, and then we say central government money about 26 billion. Um, and um, so we have lessons learned, um, holistic long-term vision, stakeholder involvement, top-down and bottom-up as the core of our governance scheme, be flexible, building with nature. It requires leadership, not only from government administrative uh, levels, but I would argue also from industry uh, to uh, to secure funding and uh, on the government side, uh, a legal basis. And every six years we uh, we uh, go back and, and see if recalibration of all of this is, requir is required looking uh, to the future. And with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for Q&A and discussion. Yes, Peter, what an amazing presentation and an amazing uh, project indeed. And given the fact that it, it, it's kind of a decade-long orientation and planning uh, hor horizon that you need to have, besides the subject matter expertise that you need to have, you all obviously also need to be a diplomat uh, going along with all the disciplines and other parties that you need to find solutions and a way forward. And I would say in the interest of time, we jump right into the questions uh, and we've received many questions. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go through all of them uh, due to the time, but we might take a few minutes more after the, the full hour, three o'clock, uh, if you don't mind, and I hope many uh, visitors have some, some more minutes to stay. Uh, but here, a very interesting one indeed, um, given the higher probability of extreme weather events, should design condition calculation for constructions be changed? Who takes or should take action on these? So maybe this is something for Peter just to follow up on your presentation, yeah. then I yeah. uh, involve the panel. Yes. Well, uh, we are continuously updating our design criteria and, uh, and also based on one of the graphics that, uh, that Jeanette uh, uh, showed, uh, up to the year 2050, uh, let's say the climate uh, uh, scenarios of increased uh, temperature rise and sea level rise are not much different uh, if we meet the Paris Agreement or it goes out of hand, uh, to put it mildly. Um, or not so mildly. Um, and so in our current design for the flood defenses, uh, for instance, uh, new works that are executed right now, we already uh, calculate with uh, 
uh, 80 centimeters to 100 centimeters, so one meter extra sea level rise on top of what we had. And this is much faster than the 20 centimeters per uh, century that uh, is measured currently. So we build in some safety measures there, and then from there, the calculus is done and the design is, is carried out. Mm -hmm. I don't know is if that anything... answers the question, but that's how we do it. Yeah. I think it gives us a direction, and maybe, Jeroen, you could add uh, from a business and risk uh, perspective to, to, to the elements that uh, Peter just outlined. Is there anything you would like to add or comment? Well, maybe with respect to uh, the rising sea level especially, I, I would love to take the opportunity to mention that um, all the activities that are going on now are being conducted by many of the uh, people in the audience or the companies uh, 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 people in the audience work for. And uh, I only refer to uh, the Asleidijk and all the improvement measures uh, that are being uh, done at the moment uh, together with a step into the future with innovation on renewable energy, um, on biodiversity, etc. This is something that uh, we as Swiss Re from the Dutch office really want to support. We have a focus over there, and uh, we believe that uh, yeah, this, this is state-of-the-art what is happening in many ways. So this is just a, a sort of a positive comment that I want to, to make uh, towards the problem. Uh, and maybe even expand a little bit that uh, the expertise that has been built uh, in, 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 the, in the centuries, as Peter outlined, is exported all over the world. And uh, it's not only uh, for protection of assets and uh, money, but it's also for the protection of, uh, of lives of people. Mm -hmm. Maybe now we go towards another question that came in from a student, actually, and thinking about the students, having students in a webinar, uh, the, the entire Delta project is for future generations to build and to consider, and this is, but this is more related to probably uh, Jeanette's work. So this, the student asked, to, to what extent is draft uh, attributable to climate change? What do you think? Um, drought. Drought yeah, att yeah, yeah, attributable yeah, yeah. to climate change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they, they uh, try to do some studies on this, um, but it depends on very much on how you define drought. Um, there are many different uh, definitions for it, but I, um, well, in, in the end, I think you can uh, attribute it to uh, to climate change, but it also depends on uh, on rainfall. Often, the, the, the the definition is used, which uh, combines the uh, precipitation and even the transpiration. And as I said before, the precipitation is very variable from one year to another year. And that makes it more difficult to see whether there is a clear trend. But for the Netherlands, we uh, did a study recently, and we saw that there is a trend for the inland area towards uh, um, more drought. Okay, very interesting uh, that, to hear that and also maybe build a bridge over to, to Lucia. Do you have a point of view on this one? I would say that uh, globally um, for droughts, uh, heat waves and wildfires in general, the link with rising temperatures is more direct. Uh, at least we have a higher level of confidence that the link is direct and therefore these are increasing as a result of climate change. Because again, here for this type of periods, physical theory, numerical modeling and observation all converge improving the increase due to uh, rising temperatures. For the other perils like, for example, hurricanes we saw before, this link is much less um, the level of confidence for these perils is, is definitely uh, lower. As I said, this is globally. Um, when it comes to assessing the risk locally, then there are a lot of other variables that you need to consider as well. Thank you very much. Um, maybe over to the Delta project again, because given that this is such a long-standing and, and complex initiative, there is one question that came in um, that read like, did the Dutch Delta Works protect the Netherlands against sea level rise of 40 centimeter and costed already 30% of GDP, if I remember correctly, uh, as, as this uh, uh, visitor states, how will the Netherlands deal with and protect itself against a one to four meter sea level rise? And how will it pay for it? 
So maybe I would start with you, Peter, to, to comment on this one and then also have the other panelists to jump on that one for the final round here. Well, I, I didn't see the, the exact question. I didn't exactly catch uh, the number that you said, but currently uh, what, I, what is in the slide, so I refer back to that, is that all of the water charges and tariffs on the public side is about 8 billion annually. The Delta program is about 1 billion annually, and from that, uh, 40, 400 uh, million is invested every year in new uh, protection uh, uh, work. So, so those are so are, those are the figures, and that is about. Uh, so, the eight billion is one percent of GDP. Having said that, um, we are confident with that with the current, let's say, strategies uh, towards uh, 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 flood protection from the sea and the and the rivers, we can we can manage uh, one to two meters sea level rise extra. Um, uh, outside uh, uh, that, so, so more than uh, uh, two meters, then we have to rethink and perhaps, perhaps redesign our country. And uh, I know Deltares is in the audience. Uh, they, uh, on the request of the uh, former, uh, my predecessor, former Delta Commissioner, uh, presented a report of all kinds of theories and, and ideas and, 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 and proposals that are floating around and they fall in a number of categories. So you can either sort of maintain the current coastline at great cost, uh, and then there is a decision to be made, do we maintain open estuaries and river mouths? Also for the port of Rotterdam, very important to be an open accessible port, or do we have finally to close it? And then you would have great gigantic pumping stations to, uh, to uh, carry the water from the rivers to the sea. Uh, or we we have a forward uh, 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 strategy with islands uh, uh, in front of our current coastline connected by dams, and so you would have new land there, maybe a freshwater a laguna behind those islands, at great cost, obviously. And and then and then finally, you know, there is also uh, theoretically at least uh, the the option of 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 well, a retreat even. Um, so um, we are discussing this, and we've entered into a, um, a, 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 a knowledge program. We call it Kennis Programma Sea Level Rise uh, for the next uh, five to six years. It's an initiative of the minister and myself uh, in, 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 uh, in combination, um, and so we will we will look at uh, what the uh, how, uh, well how far we can stretch the current approach. Uh, but also look ahead uh, towards uh, three to four um, uh, meters. But it's too early to say, uh, too early to say when this will happen, but also too early to say how. But we have to be prepared, and this is what we're working on. And now thinking of the private sector, and now Jeroen, over to you for a final comment here. And if you put yourself into the shoes of the visitors of today's webinars, your partners, your clients, um, uh, how does that resonate with you? Uh, uh, is there anything you would add uh, for, for additional measures in order to be prepared for the future? Or is there anything you, you would like to underpin in particular uh, uh, and with that coming to the final words here? Thank you, Rolf. Um, yeah, but what I would like to uh, stipulate as last remark maybe is that uh, there is a need for holistic risk management. Uh, we have many very sophisticated risk and insurance managers uh, on this webinar, and I know many of them do. Um, uh, depending on the, 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 the status of the company, there is room to uh, also factor in climate change. And as we have heard from the speakers, Climate change is not the only reason why we are being confronted with uh, higher losses in relation to weather or extreme weather. I think it's a no-brainer, at least it is for me, that there is a trend going on which uh, needs to be not discussed but taken action upon. And uh, I think another factor is uh, behavior. Um, uh, there was a beautiful uh, statement by Peter on the 2007 question uh, the Dutch government asked itself, can you, can you live at all in, in Holland? Is there a reason to stay living and working here? Uh, which was a clear answer given. Uh, we have more examples in the world, like Silicon Valley. Was it very smart to, to start working over there? Um, what I'm trying to say with this example is, uh, when you make decisions as a company, uh, think about all these elements where a new factory is being built or when an acquisition is being done. And um, apart from that, I think... Many risk mitigation measures uh, can and should be uh, considered and taken uh, as also being called upon by, by Peter 
um, dealing with extreme weather, I mean, the numbers of damages uh, related to the drought in the Netherlands and in, uh, in, across the border in Germany run into the billions. And this is in the agricultural sector, it's in the transport sector, it is in the, uh, the industry. Um, so um, measures uh, can and should be taken, and this is one of the main reasons why uh, I'm very happy that we were able to host this uh, webinar with uh, three fantastic speakers. So. Um, and this is my remark, Rolf, uh, please, you end. Yeah, Jeroen, thank you so much. Well, that is all we have time for today. And uh, if your question was unanswered, please reach out to Jeroen and his team from Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. And thereby, I'd like to thank Jeanette, Peter, and Lucia for their lively participation today. I'm sure you will join me in wishing them success for their plans and projects in 2020. And also with you, dear ladies and gentlemen, we would like to keep in touch so expect a follow-up email with a recorded version of the webinar and the slides as well, of course, so that you can share it at your convenience. On that note, we'll finish up. On behalf of the Swiss Re Institute and Swiss Re Corporate Solutions webinar team, I would like to thank you very much for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.